Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, church. It is a blessing to be able to worship God again uh, online. And it's a bit unfortunate that we are unable to meet physically. Uh, but by God's grace, like always, we're thankful that we can have the technology to do this. Um, please do open your Bibles. We are looking at Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. And if you haven't joined us yet, uh, we are looking, uh, the, looking at the Lord's Prayer and... Um, I can assure you that it is a very challenging and encouraging sermon series. And so I want to encourage you to come again next week. If we can meet physically next week, please join us at 10 a.m. at 26 Norwood Street at Flemington. I'm going to read it and then I'm going to pray. Matthew chapter 6, I'll read from verse 9 and then I'll read verse 10. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Our God, our Father, we worship you. Cause your name to be hallowed. Cause your name to be holy in this world and in our lives. Help us to see the beauty and glory of the gospel. Our God, our Father, Cause your kingdom to come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let your will be done in, in our lives and in this world. May your name be uplifted and honored and glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Hallowed be your name. Well, friends, what do you pray for? What do you pray for? Uh, good health? Uh, for your family and friends? Material blessings and wealth? A good education? Or a good career? Maybe you pray for relationships. Uh, it's not wrong to pray for some of these things. But I wonder, I, I wonder, when was the last time you prayed for Jesus to come again? Or when was the last time you were at a church service and you heard the minister pray for King Jesus to come again? You know, I think our prayer life and the content of our prayers often reflects our hearts and our desires. And I think as, a Christ, as Christians as a whole and as a church as a whole, we don't think too much about the coming of King Jesus and what that really means. When in reality, I think the coming of Jesus should really be the highlight of the Christian experience and hope. Oh, we sometimes get trapped and we move uh, through the motions of this world and life and we don't often pray for the coming of Jesus. When Jesus comes again, He will judge the living and the dead, and believers will join with Him in glory. Oh, what a great thing that is. What a great thing to be praying for. And in fact, Jesus in our passage today tells us to be praying for this and more. And so I want to look at the second and third petition of the Lord's Prayer. We saw the first one last week. Hallowed be your name, cause your name to be glorified and holy. We see the two other sets of petitions today. Firstly, your kingdom come. That's about judgment and glory. The second point, your will be done, is about transformation. So judgment and glory and transformation. Uh, for your information, just like last week, 
understanding these two petitions might make you not want to pray for these things. Uh, but I want to encourage you to see how great and glorious these prayers are. And so bear with me. It might sting a little, but it will be for your good. And so let's look at the first point. Your kingdom come, judgment and glory. Last week, we saw it. Hallowed be your name. It's to ask God to be working in such a way that he gets what he deserves. Ultimate, infinite glory and honor worthy of his holy name. Not only in our lives, but in the whole universe. And so last week, I emphasized a lot about the personal and individual side of hallowed be your name. God be working in my heart so that I can see how beautiful and great you are. Uh, But there's also the universal aspect of God's name being hallowed. And we see it to be in the, see it to be the case in uh, these petitions. Uh, What does Jesus um, mean by teaching his disciples and us to pray your kingdom come? Um, This is so important in understanding the universal aspect of God's name being hallowed. Um, To understand it, we need to understand God's kingdom. What is God's kingdom? So open your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 3 verse 2. Matthew chapter 3 verse 2, John the Baptist, he preaches a very clear message. And most of you should know it. What does he say? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist was preaching a message anticipating a coming kingdom with the coming of King Jesus. The king is coming and the kingdom is at hand. And Jesus would later preach the same message, which is very interesting because he's the king. Uh, If you turn your Bibles again to Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it says, From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says the same message. The kingdom is at hand. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, it tells us that Jesus went throughout all Galilee, preaching the preaching uh, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and throughout the gospel of Matthew we see over and over again Jesus talking about this kingdom and as we study God's word as we read through the gospels we find that that God's kingdom is God's reign and rule with him as king and he is indeed the king of creation isn't he He's the king of the universe. And we know in the book of Revelation that Jesus is uh, called the king of kings and the lord of lords. We find out that God's kingdom is where God is king and Jesus is king. And we find out that in God's kingdom, God rules over his citizens. And so when we think about it a little bit more, in the coming of King Jesus, King Jesus brings his kingdom and he's working his purposes throughout the gospel. But it's not fully complete. And the Bible talks about this kingdom that Jesus is talking about in the gospels, which will be fully completed when King Jesus comes again to judge the living and the dead. Um, In theological terms, we say that God's kingdom is now but not yet, or already but not yet. In the coming of King Jesus, the kingdom has come. The kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is near. And we can experience the benefits of salvation in the present life partially because of what Christ has done on the cross. We can experience parts of the kingdom in the here and now because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. But not fully, right? We will experience it in fullness 
when Christ comes again. God's kingdom reigns now over this world, and we as Christians are waiting for Christ to fully finalize his purposes and plans. Satan was defeated 2,000 years ago. Jesus at the cross defeated sin and death. And even though we live in a world full of sin, we can be assured that Jesus has the victory. We are just waiting. As God's people, waiting for him to come in judgment and glory. God's kingdom is already working by bringing people to himself. God's kingdom is already here partially uh, with the citizens of his kingdom waiting for the king. In one sense, the kingdom is here, but in another sense, we're waiting. We're waiting for it to be completed. And so when we pray for God's kingdom to come, we are asking for Jesus to come right now. Fully finalize your kingdom in judgment and glory. Are there two sides of the coin? Judgment for everyone means unbelievers will be condemned. Unbelievers will be condemned. And those who have been saved by grace through faith in Christ alone will be glorified. And that's why I said to pray your kingdom come. It's about judgment and glory. It's about when Jesus comes again and he comes in judgment, condemning unbelievers and glorifying believers. And maybe you're excited. Are are you excited for the coming of Jesus? Maybe you're excited to go to heaven. Oh, what a great place that will be. Maybe you look at your life and you look at this world and you don't really like it. Maybe you feel tired, you have health issues. Maybe you're in pain and it's been a long time long time and you long to be in the new creation that's a good thing to long to be with king jesus it's a good thing to be not fully attached to this world we are sojourners we are just passing through people journeying through this world waiting to meet king jesus I I love this song, which says, This world is not my own, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Right. My treasures are not in this world. My treasures are in heaven. It's a good thing to be praying for God's kingdom to come. And we should be praying for the coming of Jesus. Because that's a sight to behold. But, but what if Jesus came today? Do you understand the implications of that prayer if Jesus did come today? We often glorify the good things, heaven and glory. But we quickly pass the other side of the coin. Unbelievers will be judged as well. Those who have not fallen at the feet of the throne of grace will be condemned and eternal judgment will be their destination. You know, some of us, most of us, have unbelieving family and friends. Maybe we have an unbelieving husband or wife, a father or mother, a son or daughter, grandchild. Friends who we've known for a long time. Neighbors. Maybe some of them are unchurched. Don't go to church anymore. Don't really believe in Jesus. Oh, brothers and sisters, there should be a great burden on our hearts if we want God to come in judgment and glory. If you love your unbelieving family and friends, your unbelieving neighbors, should you not be doing something about it if you're praying for God's kingdom to come? You know, it's interesting because like I said last week, 
they pray the Lord's Prayer in Parliament. But you know, a majority of the people there don't really know what they're praying for. Because if Jesus did come again, a majority of the people in Parliament will go to hell. To put it bluntly, they will be on the road to hell in condemnation. And so we really need to think about what this prayer means when we're praying, God, let your kingdom come. It means asking that the Lord Jesus, the King of Kings, would come again in judgment and glory. And it should really challenge us to think evangelistically and missionally. Now, there are some people, maybe in our congregation, who have not been coming, who have been coming for years, who've been coming to our church for years and don't have salvation. Uh, you're not saved because you go to church. You're not saved because you were baptized. You are not saved because you think you are saved and you think you have done the right things. Oh, friends, can you be assured this morning that if King Jesus came, you will be glorified? That's, that's the challenging thought. There's only one way to be assured of salvation. That's falling on your knees to the throne of grace, relying and trusting only in Jesus Christ alone. Have you really fallen on your knees? I'm being serious, church. Have you really repented, recognized your need for a Savior? Because if we take judgment and glory seriously, we need to sort out our relationship with God. We need to sort it out. And so what does it mean to pray your kingdom come? It means to pray, come Lord Jesus, come. In condemnation and judgment and glory. Judgment and glory. Uh, there are a number of th things I could say about this particular phrase, but for the sake of time, we'll leave it there. And if you have any questions about this particular petition, uh, please feel free to call me or text me or email me. Your kingdom come, judgment and glory. I hope that stirs you and help make you think about missions and evangelism. I hope that makes you want to pray for your family and friends more. I hope it makes you feel, make you become bold to tell your unbelieving family and friends that they need Jesus. You know, this prayer, your kingdom come, it's a very missional prayer. Your kingdom come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. That's the first petition. The second petition, your will be done. A bit shorter. Transformation. But what does it mean for God's will to be done? Well, theologians describe God having two wills. We say that God's eternal decrees, eternal wills, His absolute will and purposes are hidden and will always be accomplished. His eternal wills are hidden, but they will always be accomplished. We will never fully understand God's eternal plans. But wherever his eternal and perfect plans and purposes are, they will be accomplished. Nothing can stop God's eternal plans. But the second will, his revealed will, is what we find in Scripture, what he reveals to us. God's revealed will is also known as his will of precept or his perceptive will. This will tells us what the Lord finds pleasing. What does the Lord find pleasing? Uh, the word will can also mean purposes. Your purposes be done. And so when we think about God's revealed purposes and will, it's what God desires. 
what God desires of us. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says this. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so Paul is writing to Christians to not be conformed to this world, meaning Christians don't follow the patterns of this world. Christians are to live differently, be transformed. And notice what Romans 12 2 says about being transformed. You get transformed by the renewal of your mind. Verse 2, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And as you renew your mind, as your mind is transformed, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What does God want you to do? What is God's purpose for your life? In one sense, I know what God wants you to do. God wants you to read your Bible, study the Word, figure out and be transformed by Scripture. That's God's will for your life. That's God's revealed will. We can find out what is morally right and wrong by reading God's Word, His moral law and purposes through Scripture. And so when we pray, God's will be done, we are calling God to be doing what we've already prayed for, right? When we pray, God cause your name to be hallowed, cause your kingdom to come, we are asking God to be working in our hearts so that His will be done. We are asking for God to be working in people's lives so that they live, so that they live lives pleasing to Him. Do you want to live life pleasing God? Let your will be done. And if you notice, if you look at Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 10, what's the last bit of it? Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now that's an interesting phrase. What do citizens of heaven do? When you go to heaven and you enter eternal glory with King Jesus in a new creation, everyone will love and obey the King. Everyone will love and obey the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There will be no sin there. And as one theologian says, in heaven, among the angels, God's name is already honored. His kingship acknowledged and His will be done. And this prayer is that the heavenly state of affairs may be reflected also on earth. And so it's a prayer of total transformation. God, please be working in our hearts and this world right now so that it looks like heaven. God, help us to live life pleasing you. And as I said last week, it might mean giving up a lot of things. For Matthew, doing the will of God is central to the Christian life. Doing the will of God is a reflection of total transformation. Well, please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 21 to 23. Jesus gives a strong warning. He gives a strong warning. What does he say? Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Who can enter that kingdom of heaven? Those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
Verse 22, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. But who will enter the kingdom of God? Those who have been transformed by grace to live for King Jesus. And there's a strong warning there in verse 22, right? There will be people who have served God, people who have done many things. There will be people who have gone to church their whole life, but King Jesus doesn't know them. Did you hear it? On that day, on judgment day, on the coming of the kingdom, Many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works on your name, in your name. And what does Jesus say on that day? I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Oh, church, does King Jesus know you? I, I want to take God's word seriously. I really want to take God's word seriously. I take people's salvation seriously. I take people's faith seriously. Because when I read a passage like this, we have to take God's word seriously. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. To pray for your will be done on earth as it is in heaven is to pray for complete transformation. And we need that. If we want salvation, we need to be praying. Friends, we need to be praying every day for complete transformation. And I can assure you, if your lives are completely transformed, your family and friends and community will see the power of the gospel gospel, because it will be evident in your life. And I need to be praying, God, let your will be done in my life. God, help me to live life pleasing you. Do you still want to pray the Lord's Prayer? We've looked at your kingdom come. It's about praying for Jesus Christ to come again. Judgment and glory. And we prayed, we looked at your will be done. It's about transformation. The first three petitions have major implications. that to be taken seriously. And maybe this morning, you don't want to be praying the introduction of the Lord's Prayer. And maybe I've, maybe I've scared you. Maybe this morning you've been going to church your whole life. You've prayed the Lord's Prayer many times. Maybe you say, well, I don't need this prayer. I've made it. Oh, friends, brothers and sisters, The Lord's Prayer is a humbling prayer. It's a prayer for believers who have been convicted of the cross of Christ. No Christian should ever get sick of the gospel message. No Christian should ever not want God to be working supernaturally in their life. No Christian should be content on their godliness and relationship with God. The Lord's Prayer is a prayer of asking God to be doing more and more in your life. It's for God to be, it's to ask God to be working in this world and in your life in such a way to help you to love, live, and serve King Jesus. It's a prayer of anticipating the return 
of King Jesus. Do you want King Jesus to come right now? Or do you love this world more? Amen. Have a think about that. I pray that you would be praying this prayer and that you would long for the coming of Jesus. Our God, our Father, come again in glory. Cause your name to be hallowed. Cause your name to be holy in this world. Cause your kingdom to come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Judge this world, rid of this world of all its wickedness and glorify your people. Bring them in glory. We pray for unbelieving family and friends. Maybe some people in our church who don't really know you as Lord and Savior. Convict them of sin. Stir in their hearts a desire and a passion for your name by the power of your Spirit. Only you can do that, oh God, our Father. Convict sinners of sin. Transform lives. Let your will be done. That is our prayer. We pray, we pray and we cry out to you to be doing this so that your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.